This channel is dedicated to helping you explore the West because it's big and Big Bend National Park is one of our biggest. I recently made my third trip to the park and have decided that it's well worth spending a few months shooting, writing, and editing one of my comprehensive travel guides. Of course, it's named after the Big Bend in the Rio Grande River, but there's much more to the park. There's 150 miles of trails and many more miles of backcountry 4x4 trails. There's amazing scenery that has a history that goes back 130 million years. And because of that, it's one of the best fossil sites in North America. Humans have been here for thousands of years, and some of them left their mark. And from the early 1900s to the 40s, it was also a hot springs resort. And today, after a long hike, you can still relax those muscles in that 105 degree spring water. And of course, there's a rich border culture. And just outside the park, there's even some nightlife in a renovated ghost town. This is the first of what will be many segments on this fantastic national park. And now would be a good time to click that thumbs up and to subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of the future Big Bend episodes. There's also many other helpful guides on my channel to help you explore the West. It's best to visit Big Bend in the fall or the spring. In other words, when it's not hot. It's hundreds of miles from anywhere, and it's best for those who are comfortable with being self-sufficient. Its southern border is the Rio Grande, but there are no fences here or streams of migrants. It has a unique and varied landscape that ranges in elevation from 1,800 feet at the river to almost 8,000 feet in the Chizos Mountains. And how it got this way is fascinating. There are 130 million years of geologic change evident in this park. That's more than just about any place in the park system. And with this much history, it's not surprising that it's also one of the best fossil sites in the country. In 2017, the Park Service opened the Fossil Discovery Center to help showcase what makes this park so special. It's a great introduction to the park, and it helps explain how this amazing terrain got this way. And since we're going to be spending a few days hiking and driving through it, we might as well know what we're looking at. And of course, there's amazing dinosaurs in here too. And the largest living thing that has ever flown. It's located on the Persimmon Gap Entrance Road, about eight miles north of the Panther Junction Visitor Center. It has three parts. The main fossil building, a kid's play area with life-size depictions of things that lived here, and an overlook that itself is a giant fossil. This is the play area. There's a sheltered sitting area for the parents, and next to it there's a life-size steel cutout of a 30-foot long crocodile that lived here. And the kids can play on other replicas of fossils that were found here in the park, like pterosaur bones, or this. And of course, it's a place of learning. On this side of the sign, there's a question. The answer's on the back. But the biggest fossil here is this ridge. Its cap rock is a fossilized river bottom that existed about 50 million years ago. And you can follow the river all the way up to the overlook. Now let's go check out the building. This sign provides a really good overview of the park itself and all the changes it's gone through. The exhibits here have been divided into different time horizons, starting 130 million years ago and going to the present. If you're new to the deep past, take a few minutes to try to absorb what it says. This ground, the very stuff that we're walking on, has been through a lot. 130 million years ago, it wasn't even ground. It was part of the proto-Gulf of Mexico and what they call the Great Western Interior Seaway that eventually went all the way to the Arctic Ocean. I was here on a cool day in March. But if you're here in midsummer, keep in mind that this is an open structure and there is no air conditioning and it gets very hot here. There is a vault toilet, but there is no water. The first exhibit is an overview. It's here that I learned that over 1,200 species of extinct creatures have been found in the park, including parts of a T-Rex and the largest living thing that has ever flown. Our timeline begins when, when all of this was part of the proto-Gulf of Mexico. And there's gonna be a bunch of words that I'm going to mispronounce, but please forgive me and, and don't write a nasty comment. And the first of these names I'm gonna mangle is a Mosasaur, which is like a giant crocodile. The ones found in the park were up to 30 feet long. But there were also clams, oysters, ammonites, and early versions of sharks. 
The next display case shows that there were a lot of mean-looking things back then, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce this name. Luckily, Wikipedia says that many people just call it the X-fish. It's a bony predator that grew to be about 18 feet long. It lived 90 million years ago in the shallow-ish waters of the Western Interior Seaway. And as you might expect, it was one of the top predators. As we go to the next room, we're moving up the timeline to 83 to 72 million years ago, when the area was a coastal marsh and delta, because the land was pushed up by the same forces that started to create the Rocky Mountains. Because of all of that, what we now see as a desert looked more like Florida. It was a coastal area with trees and warm tropical seas. And the warm, humid climate was perfect for dinosaurs. This mural shows you what it looked like. The next display reminds us that not all like fossils, fossils are big. Most are actually quite small. And they actually make up much of the limestone found in the park. But let's face it, the big ones are more interesting. This plant-eating dino had a skull that's seven feet long. There was a lot of diversity at this time, and this thing was 28 feet long, and it lived near turtles, clams, and this guy, which is a smaller tyrannosaur. This skull was found in Utah, but some of its other bones were found here. And now we're going into the Gallery of Giants. Here you can touch a bronze skull of one of those 30-foot crocs. That's what she's doing. But make sure you look up. That's a life-size pterosaur whose bones were found in the park. Its wingspan is 35 feet. And technically, it's not a dinosaur, it's a lizard. And it's the biggest flying creature to have ever lived. But it doesn't seem to get the same reaction as the mean-looking skulls. This is a T-Rex skull. Large tyrannosaur bones have been found in the park, but not enough to determine if they were a T-Rex. The model for this skull was found outside the park. But it's still an impressive thing, and you can touch it. Because the murals are more than just pretty decorations. They convey a lot of information. In this one, we see how the big flying things flew, and how they stood. They were at least as tall as the T-Rex. And it also shows that they lived in a coastal forest. Big pterosaurs are found throughout the world, often near water. So it's assumed that fish were at least part of their diet. Of course, the tyrannosaur, he would eat whatever he wanted. And weirdly, something tried to eat them. The two holes in this dinosaur bone are from one of the 30-foot-long crocs that lived here. The other bronze skull in this section is one of those giant crocs. Plants are also part of the story of change. We've already seen that the desert was once a tropical forest. We know this because lots of fossilized wood has been found here. We even walked past some near the entrance. There's still a few more dinosaurs to see, but from here we can see evidence of the event that led to their demise. We all know the story of the meteor that hit the Earth a few hundred miles south of here 66 million years ago. Big Bend is the only national park that has geology from the time of this event. For now, there are just these tubes, pointing to the rock formations that record the evidence. In the next room, there are a few more bones found in the park. This is the leg bone of an Alamosaurus. It weighed about 65,000 pounds and was 80 feet long. It was one of the last giant sauropods. And this is an interesting little side note. They brought the bone out of the backcountry in an old canoe because they're not allowed to use mechanized land vehicles in the backcountry. At this time, the land was still changing. It continued to rise, forcing the sea and the coastline farther south. The climate was changing too. It was becoming cooler, but the age of dinosaurs was coming to an end just as they were becoming more impressive. This is the seven-foot-long skull of a plant eater that has only been found in Big Bend. They named it Bravoceratops. It was 28 feet long and weighed 11,000 pounds. He's kin to the better-known Triceratops. After the dinosaurs were wiped out, little furry mammals started to take over, and eventually they got big too. 
About 42 million years ago, the land started another dramatic change. Volcanoes formed northwest of the park, including this nearly perfectly formed strata of volcano. And I'll talk more about the volcanoes and the rifting and the faulting a little later. After the dinosaurs, little furry mammals had little competition. And by 55 million years ago, they had evolved into huge megafauna. Their bones were found in the park, too. Some in the riverbed, right out front. Some looked like mastodons. Others like weird hippos. But just before the exit, we see the bones of some of the more recently extinct mammals, like a saber-toothed cat. And look at that camel. And now it's time to head out to the overlook, but there's one last reminder. The park is asking us to preserve any fossils that we happen to find. Don't take them home. It's actually a federal crime to do so. Now we're going to head up to the overlook. The paved trail follows the old river channel. 50 million years ago, that's exactly where a little river flowed. Yep, South Texas sure has changed a lot in the last 50 million years. The info signs in this park are really good. This one tells us how to interpret the ripples that we see in the silt. And this one tells us why the fossil discovery exhibit was put here. In 1957, ancient mammal bones were found here, in this old river channel. Now I'm walking on what was the sandy bottom of that old river. It has since turned to sandstone, which is much harder to erode than the stuff that's quite obviously been blown away because we're about 30 feet above the ground here. Those mountains off to the right are the furthest east of the Basin and Rage province, which is caused by the spreading of the Earth's crust several hundred miles west of here. Those are hoodoos, and they're the mark of another old river channel. Before I go too far astray, it's time to wrap this one up. The exhibits in this little building showed us just how much Big Bend has changed in 130 million years. Back then, this was all underwater. Then it was an estuary. Then the Earth was literally ripping itself apart, and volcanoes were building mountains. While some of the biggest and meanest creatures to ever have lived did their best to adapt to all of these changes. In future episodes, we'll hike down to the hot springs in Big Bend, We'll walk through the 1,500-foot canyons. We'll hike through an old volcanic basin, drive some amazing roads, and maybe even have a margarita in a ghost town. <laughs>